When people talk about colonizing other worlds, the conversation almost always turns to Mars. Now, Venus, on the other hand, well, most people have written it off as the solar system's acid planet from hell, and that was me. I was, I was people. Now, crushing surface pressures, temperatures hot enough to melt lead, clouds made of literal acid, not exactly the Airbnb listing of your dreams. But here's the thing. If you zoom out, compare the physics, the distances, and the logistics, Venus actually starts looking shockingly competitive. In fact, in many ways, it's actually more habitable than Mars. My name's Brad, you're watching Hello From Space, and today we're gonna to look at five reasons Venus might actually be the best off-Earth real estate for humanity to colonize. Well, let's start with the basics, distance. Now, Mars is far enough away that even in the best launch windows, those rare alignments where the planet's just in the right positions, you're looking at a journey of six to nine months. And once you get there, you might have to wait another year and a half before the Earth and Mars line up again for a trip home. Now, Venus, on the other hand, is much closer. At its nearest, it's just over 40 million kilometers away, almost half the distance to Mars at its closest. Now, that means significantly shorter travel times, around three to five months each way. So why does that matter? Well, two reasons, really. Now, the first is radiation exposure. In deep space, you're constantly bombarded by cosmic rays and the occasional solar storm if you're unlucky. Now, the less time you spend in that environment, the better. But it also means less shielding is necessary on the ship. Now, since radiation shielding generally tends to be pretty heavy, this equates to more usable payload, which of course means that you can take a couple extra cases of this video's sponsor. I'm just kidding. Life support costs. Now, every month in space means more food, water, oxygen, and spare parts you have to bring with you. Now, smaller supply requirements mean even more usable payload. Now, there is another hidden benefit. Now, because Venus is closer, you can plan missions with more flexible return options. Now, Mars missions often have that you're stuck there for 18 months problem because of the orbital mechanics. But with Venus, the shorter distance means there are mission profiles with quicker turnaround times, giving crews more emergency exit strategies if something goes wrong. Think of it like moving house. If Mars is moving to another city, Venus is just moving to the next suburb. Both take planning, but one is gonna cost you less in fuel, time, and stress. And when you're talking about building the first off-world human settlement, saving months of travel time isn't just a luxury, it's a serious survival advantage. Space flight can be unpredictable, more options equals better. Okay, let's get this out of the way. Living on the surface of Venus is not an option in any way, shape or form. It's 460 degrees Celsius down there, hot enough to melt lead or hot enough to cook your frozen pizza in like seven seconds flat. Oh, the pressure is also 92 times that of Earth at sea level, which is equivalent to being nearly a kilometer underwater or about 2,950 feet into the ocean steps. Now, that is a quarter of the way to the Titanic wreck. And if either of those don't kill you, the clouds of sulfuric acid will. Venus' surface is, without exaggeration, one of the most hostile environments in the solar system. So why are we talking about colonizing it? Well, at about 50 to 60 kilometers above the surface, everything changes. Now up there, the pressure drops to around one atmosphere, the same as Earth at sea level. The temperature is also a comfortable 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, perfect t-shirt weather. And while the air is still mostly carbon dioxide, the pressure isn't gonna crush you into a pancake. In other words, there's a Goldilocks zone in Venus atmosphere. Not too hot, not too cold, not too much pressure, just right. Now, NASA actually studied this in detail in 2015 with a concept called HAVOC, the High Altitude Venus Operational Concept. The idea was simple, but very clever. Don't live on the ground, live in the sky at an altitude of around 50 kilometers, or about 31 miles for my American friends. Now, picture this, massive airships the size of cruise liners filled with breathable air that's actually lighter than the surrounding carbon dioxide atmosphere. That's the cool thing. On Venus, just filling a balloon with Earth air is enough to make it float. Now these floating cities would drift through the upper atmosphere like giant white whales, soaking up virtually endless sunlight for power and cruising above the toxic clouds. 
you can have entire neighbourhoods suspended in the sky, connected by bridges and cable cars. No constant battle against bone loss like on the moon or Mars, no underground bunkers to hide from cosmic rays like on most of the Jovian moons that we've discussed in one of my previous videos, just a constant Earth-like gravity, temperature and pressure. Now, with that being said, it's not without challenges. Now, those clouds are still full of sulfuric acid droplets, but at this altitude, they're a lot more manageable. We already have materials like Teflon coatings and certain plastics that shrug off acid exposure for decades. The main problem wouldn't be the acid eating through the hull, but making sure you filter and scrub it from anything that comes inside. Then there's the wind. Venus' atmosphere super rotates, meaning it circles the planet much faster than the surface rotates. So if you were floating up there, you'd be carried around the entire planet every four Earth days. That's not a problem though, I guess it's kind of a feature. Now, unfortunately, you wouldn't get a changing view like you would on Earth because everywhere you look is just gonna be more highly reflective sulfuric acid clouds. So when people say Venus is uninhabitable, they're only half right. The surface, complete nightmare, like being eaten by the blob. But in the clouds, pretty manageable. You're not gonna be walking around outside in a shirt, shorts and thongs, or flip flops for my American friends again, but otherwise it's not too bad. This is a completely different way of thinking about interplanetary colonization. Mars wants you underground in radiation shelters or in large radiation shielded domes, but Venus on the other hand, invites you to build a Star Wars-esque cloud city. They won't look like that unfortunately, but still cool. Now, one of the biggest challenges in space settlement isn't how to get there, it's what happens to our bodies when we arrive. Now, unfortunately, it isn't just weightless fun. Microgravity slowly turns us into something Earth native humans just aren't built for. Now, the problem is with low gravity on Mars, for instance, which is just about 38% of the Earth's gravity, or the Moon, which is only 16% of the Earth's gravity, our bodies face serious stress. Now, on the ISS, for instance, Astronauts experience muscle atrophy, and postural muscles can shrink by up to 30% over just a few months, and peak strength can drop around 31%. Now, bone density loss, which is far more serious, astronauts can lose 1-2% to of bone mass per month. Then there's also cardiovascular changes, where fluid shifts cause facial puffiness, reduced blood volume, or orthostatic intolerance, feeling dizzy or faint when standing. Now this is actually one of the reasons a lot of astronauts bring hot sauce with them for their stay on the ISS. Now without gravity constantly pulling fluids like blood and mucus downwards, they tend to build up in the head and cause a sort of decreased sense of taste and smell. Many compare it to the stuffy head feeling of having a cold, which I'm actually recovering from at the moment, or allergies. Now the hot sauce helps them actually taste something when they're in space. Space food generally tends to be pretty bland regardless. Now these aren't just cosmetic issues, they are serious physiological risks. Especially if we plan multi-decade settlements, without gravity working for us, bones decay, muscles atrophy, vision can worsen, and your heart and balance systems can go haywire. Now when astronauts return to Earth after long ISS missions, the readaption period is rough. Now, take Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams, for example, who spent nine months in space. Now, they suffered chicken legs or weak lower body muscles, fluid imbalance, otherwise known as baby feet, and serious coordination issues. Many astronauts can regain baseline balance in just seven to 10 days, but muscle strength and coordination require more time. Most astronauts recover pre-flight muscle mass and tone in one to two months with fairly rigorous physical therapy. Now, bone health risks though take much longer, sometimes years. Now, vision and cardiovascular issues typically normalize within weeks to months, but long-term risks like spaceflight associated neuroocular syndrome, or SANS for short, or heart deconditioning can linger. Now other changes like gene expression patterns mostly reset, though about 7% remain altered permanently. Basically the microgravity, radiation, and changes to circadian rhythms cause some genes to become more active and others less active affecting things like immune function, bone and muscle maintenance, and stress response. So what does that have to do with Venus? Well, floating high above Venus yields about 0.9 G, or about 90% of Earth's gravity, almost exactly Earth normal. Now, that means you could sprint down hallways with near familiar effort, 
not lazily float about like a weak old helium balloon. Basic biological systems, bones, muscles, balance, blood pressure, even vision, remain largely Earth-stable. So you avoid the severe physical deterioration and long recovery periods that plague Mars or Moon colonies. Think of it this way. Gravity is the body's silent friend. Our bodies need this resistance to function correctly. Now, Venusian gravity gives our bodies the resistance they need. Now, if you're going to build a city, especially a floating one in the sky of another planet, you'd better have a pretty reliable way to power it. On Mars, that's already a problem. Mars only gets about 43% as much sunlight as the Earth, thanks to its distance from the sun. Now, the inverse square law applies here. The sun radiates energy outwards equally in all directions. But as that energy spreads, it covers a larger and larger sphere. Now, the surface area of a sphere grows with the square of the distance. That means the farther away you are, the thinner and thinner the energy is spread. So if you double your distance from the sun, the solar energy per square meter, otherwise known as irradiance, drops to one quarter. Now, at three times the distance, it drops to one ninth and so on and so forth. Now, this is the reason why every Mars-based concept you've probably ever seen has huge solar arrays spread out like reflective wheat fields or relies on nuclear reactors to make up the shortfall. And even then, Martian dust storms can block the sun for weeks or even months, cutting solar power output to almost nothing. Now, Venus, on the other hand, is practically a solar farm waiting to happen. At Venus orbital distance, sunlight is about 1.9 times more intense than on Earth. That's nearly double the power just for being closer to the sun. And if you're living in the atmosphere around 50 to 60 kilometers altitude, you're above the thickest cloud layers in the brightest part of the sky. That means your solar panels would get consistent high intensity light almost all the time. In fact, unlike Earth, because the Venusian atmosphere super rotates, as we discussed earlier, your floating city isn't stuck in darkness for half the day. You're moving with the winds, constantly alternating between sunlit and shaded regions in a way that keeps your solar panels productive. But here's where it gets even better. Venus cloud cities could combine solar power with high altitude wind energy. Now, these super rotating winds are strong and consistent, potentially giving you a backup energy source for nighttime or for extra cloudy periods. Turbines mounted above or below the city could spin almost constantly, adding to your power supply without having to burn any sort of fuel. And if you really wanted to push the limits, you could use that abundant solar energy to split water into hydrogen and oxygen for fuel, or to power atmospheric processing plants that pull useful chemicals from the surrounding air. That means not only running your life support systems, but also manufacturing plastics, fuels, and even metals without needing a constant supply line from Earth. In short, where Mars settlers will be dusting off their solar panels after every storm and rationing power during the winter, Venus settlers could be running high energy industries, indoor farming, whole city air conditioning without breaking a sweat. When you're building the first real cities off Earth, energy isn't just a utility. It's a foundation of survival. And in that department, Venus offers one of the best deals in the entire solar system. If you're gonna build a permanent home somewhere in the solar system, you need more than just a place to live. You need resources, the raw materials to build, repair, feed, and fuel your settlement without depending on constant supply runs from Earth. Self-sufficiency is absolutely key. And here's the thing, the Venusian atmosphere is loaded. Now at 50 to 60 kilometers up, you're sitting in a gaseous ocean of carbon dioxide, about 96% of the atmosphere, with a few percent nitrogen and traces of other gases. Now that's not just random chemistry, that's a toolkit. That carbon dioxide can be split into carbon and oxygen, carbon dioxide or CO2, being one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Now the oxygen obviously keeps your colony breathing, which is pretty handy, but the carbon can be used to make things like plastics, carbon composites, even structural materials like carbon fiber, which means that Venusian F1 is looking pretty good. Now, nitrogen is a vital buffer gas for breathable air. It makes up about 78% of Earth's atmosphere. This is probably one of the more overlooked factors in space colonization. You cannot survive 
just on oxygen. You need a buffer gas like nitrogen or helium. Now, living in a pure oxygen environment long-term is dangerous. It leads to nasty things like oxygen toxicity, and eventually down the line, pulmonary fibrosis. Basically, the scarring of your lungs. There's also the fire danger, which was tragically realized in the Apollo 1 test. Now, having access to nitrogen on Venus is a huge win. It's also a key ingredient for things like fertilizers, which you're gonna use for growing food. Now, sulfur compounds from the clouds can also be processed into sulfuric acid, useful for industrial chemistry, or even elemental sulfur, which can be used in construction materials or electronics manufacturing. And while Venus is famously pretty dry compared to Earth, there is water in the atmosphere in small amounts, and you can harvest it. Think of giant atmospheric processing towers or drone swarms pulling in air, filtering out useful compounds, and feeding them into floating factories. You wouldn't need to dig into the ground or drill into rock. Your mine is the air you're floating in. Because you're not dealing with the crushing pressures of the surface, heavy machinery doesn't need to be built like a submarine. Instead, floating industrial platforms could operate much like factories on Earth, except their raw materials literally drift by the wind. A network of these floating factories could continuously refine the atmosphere into metals, building materials, fuels, even life support supplies. Now, Venus offers the potential for a closed loop system. Now, solar power fuels your factories, factories pull resources from the atmosphere, those resources build more factories, habitats, and vehicles. More infrastructure means more capacity for harvesting and production. Before long, you've gone from one floating outpost to an entire network of floating sky cities, each contributing to a shared economy and doing it without relying on constant shipments from Earth. Now, this is where Venus starts to really shine. Now, Mars might be more photogenic with its red deserts and ancient riverbeds, but in terms of raw, renewable local resources, Venus atmosphere is a gift. You just have to be clever enough to use it. So, Venus, the hell planet that most people write off, including me, I will admit, until recently, <laughs> but if you stay smart and live up in the clouds, it's actually the most Earth-like place in the whole solar system, other than Earth, obviously. Now, it's close, it's got Earth-level gravity, endless solar power, and an atmosphere that's basically a floating supermarket for raw materials. Now, Mars might still get more attention, and look, I get it. Red dust, sci-fi vibes are pretty hard to beat. But if you're looking for the place where humans could actually build a big, comfortable, long-term home off Earth, Venus is maybe the serious contender. Now, if you liked or found this video interesting, go ahead and click on one of my other videos. It'll be popping up on the screen in a minute. And if you like those and want to see more, then I invite you to go ahead and hit that sub button. I'm trying to get these videos out every two weeks. I'm doing my best, I promise. Now, this is a fairly new channel, and honestly, the growth over the last month or so has absolutely blown me away. So I want to thank every one of you that has watched, liked, and subbed. I genuinely really appreciate you being here and I can guarantee you I'm working on some super exciting stuff in the background, which I can't wait to put out, but you'll have to wait and see. It's coming, I promise. Anyway, that's it for me. Thanks for watching. Have an awesome week and I'll see you next time.